shadow knows. <laughs> Your local blue coal dealer presents The Shadow. These half-hour dramatizations are designed to forcibly demonstrate to old and young alike that crime does not pay. Before today's story begins, an important message to all householders. When ordering fuel, remember that there's a tremendous difference between various kinds of hard coal. And remember that there's one hard coal that offers you better heat with less furnace attention. And that's blue coal. You'll find that blue coal banks and burns better and gives you absolutely the most for your money in heating service and satisfaction. So ask for blue coal by name the next time you order fuel. And be sure to listen at the close of today's program, for we have a special guest whom we wish to introduce to you. The shadow, mysterious character who aids those in distress and helps the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the unseen voice belongs. The only one who knows the true identity of that master of other people's minds, the shadow. Today's story, Hypnotic Death. Herbert, uh, why did you bring me to this doctor's office? I want you to meet the famous Dr. Dharma. He's a friend of mine. We might even get him to be my best man. Oh, Herbert, it makes me so happy to hear you making plans for our wedding. Martha, dear, you stay here a minute. I want to prepare Dr. Dharma for the big surprise. Yes, Herbert. Uh, Hiya, fellas. Well, look who's here. Charming Charlie himself. Cut that, Fats. The name's Herbert Van Bursten for the present. Uh Uh-oh. You got something in town, huh, Charlie? Uh, I mean... uh, Yeah, yeah. Where's the doctor? Oh, he's inside with one of the lawyers. He'll be right out. What do you got, I bet? A servant girl. No living relations. Yeah, perfect. Made to order. What kind of a policy she got? 10,000 life, double indemnity. All right. Uh, you sure know how to pick her. You don't do so bad yourself. <laughs> <laughs> hey, here's the doc now. Hello, Dr. Dahmer. Well, Herbert, we've been waiting for you. You know lawyer Manson? Yeah. Where's the girl? In the waiting room. Good. Have you her policy? Yeah, right here. There you are. Look it over, Manson. See that everything is in order. Sure, let me have it. Uh, usual form. No inserts. Double indemnity for death. Beneficiary, Herbert Van Bursten. That's uh, made out to you, all right. You bet. That's okay. Very well. Bring the girl in. Okay, Doctor. See that the boys have their instructions, Manson. Right, Doctor. Come right in, Martha. Yes, Herbert. These men are friends of mine, and this... Is the great Dr. Dahmer. Pleased to meet you, Doctor. I have it for ten. Come here, Martha. Close to me. Uh, yes, sir. Look at me. Look into my eyes. Herbert. Look into my eyes, Martha. Oh, Herbert. Uh, take me out of here. I. Martha. I am afraid. I don't. Run. Look into your. Now, Martha. From this moment on, I will control your mind. My will shall be your will. My instructions, your commands. Whether or not I'm with you, whether or not you see me, you will obey my orders. Obey your orders? Yes. Obey my orders. All right, men, you must be going. You are about to witness an even greater demonstration of my principle of telepathic hypnosis. The car with Herbert and the girls just pulling over to the curb, Dr. Dahmer. Where are the boys? I see, they're standing on the corner. Herbert's getting out of the car. Very well. Stop the car. Oh, this far away, Doctor? And distance in no way affects my powers. I must close my eyes and concentrate. Keep me informed of the results, Manson. Right. Say, a girl stepped out of the car. Yes. Now to test my theory of telepathic hypnosis. Martha. Martha. Move close to the curb. She's doing it, Doctor. She's there. Stop, Martha. Wait for my orders. 
She's standing at the curb. Is there a car coming, Munson? Yes, there's one coming down the street at a fast clip. How far from the girl? How about 200 feet. Yes. 150 now. Yes. 100. Uh-huh. 50. And now, Martha. 25. Walk, Martha. Walk. 10. She's... <laughs> Well, that's done, Dr. Dahmer. Yes, it is quite done, Munson. Quite. Look, look, she's dead. Yeah. Dead? You murderer? You killed my fiancé. I didn't mean to do you it. You killed the right there, you paper. Stand back. Now, buddy. What happened? Well, the girl stepped right in front of my car, officer. I couldn't stop. Yeah, of course you couldn't. You were going too fast. All right, all right, all right. We can't argue that out here. I'll have to place you under arrest, young fellow. Uh, just a moment, officer. What do you want? I saw what happened. That young man is not to blame. Why? Uh, the always... girl walked right in front of the car. Well, you'd better let me have your name. Cranston. Lamont Cranston. Say, officer, this man's talking through his hat. This woman was killed by a reckless driver. Officer, yeah. there's something very peculiar about this whole thing. Oh, I beg your pardon. Uh, excuse me, officer. I'm Dr. Dharma. Well, what is it? You witness to this? No, this... I'm not. I didn't see it. But as a citizen, I feel that reckless driving must come to an end. You say you didn't see what happened? That is correct. Well, then you'll pardon me, but I hardly think you're in a position to voice an opinion in this matter, Dr. Dharma. I see. You, of course, are a witness for the driver. Exactly. Very noble of you. Very. I assure you, sir, that you and I will meet again. Yes, I'm sure... We will meet again. Lamont, you've hardly touched your dinner. Are you ill? The strangest feeling's been creeping upon me since that automobile accident. Lamont, your voice sounds awfully strange. Yes, I... I must shake this off. I, I must... Perhaps some more coffee would help, Lamont. That's... Lamont, why are you staring so... You, a guy, will meet again. What are you saying? Yes. I'm sure we will meet. You dropped the cup. What is the matter? We. Uh... Wait, wait, there's somebody help. What what is, what is I don't it? know. He just simply toppled over. Some terrible thing has come over him. <laughs> Now, Miss Lane, try and calm yourself. Nurse, how long will I have to wait for some news about Mr. Cranston? Dr. Just... Anthony and Dr. Whitman are with him now. You must be patient. I don't understand it. He was so well only yesterday, and now I just can't believe it. Oh, here's Dr. Anthony now. Dr. Anthony, how is he? Oh, just a moment, Miss Lane. Nurse, will you stay with Mr. Cranston? Yes, of course, Doctor. Sit down, Miss Lane. I want to talk to you. But, Doctor, how is he? No better. What? If anything, he's worse. That may be brutal, Miss Lane, but you should know the facts. Oh, Doctor, it sounds frightful. I've called in every specialist I thought might help. We're completely stumped, Miss Lane. Never in our experience have we encountered such a strange case. Well, what can it be? We don't know. All the vital organs are in excellent condition. Yet his energy is rapidly ebbing. Oh. I hate to have to tell you this, Miss Lane, but... We're afraid Mr. Cranston won't last the night. Oh, no. Oh, no, that can't be possible. The most discouraging thing is Mr. Cranston's complete lack of cooperation. He seems to have lost the desire to live. Oh, I must go to him. He must fight this thing off, whatever it is. Come along, Miss Lane. We put him in this room right across the hall. There we are. Now, Miss Lane, try to arouse his interest in something. Yes, Doctor, I will. Step right in. Lamont. Oh, Lamont. Margo. How are you, Lamont? Are you any better? Something. Pressy. Where? Here. My head. Oh. Hands. Squeezing. Lamont, listen to me, please. Your life is in your own hands. You must fight, Lamont. Fight. Here. Fight. Obey. Order. My will. Your will. What do you mean? What are you trying to tell us, Lamont? Uh, can't tell you. He won't let me. What's that? Who won't let you? Uh, can't tell you. You must tell us. You must obey orders. Lamont, you've got to tell us. 
We want to help you. I'm tired. Sleepy. Doctor. Doctor, would you step over here a moment? Well, of course, Mr. Doctor, don't think I'm mad, but the man in that bed is not Lamont Cranston. Not the... Miss Lane. The body is Lamont Cranston, all right, but the spirit is not here. Well, that doesn't make sense. Let me explain. Isn't it true that when a person suffers from a uh, psychosis, they mutter of things and experiences of the past? Yes, yes, that's quite correct. Well, these things Mr. Cranston's been saying, I've never heard him say before. No, but... Doctor, I'm convinced Mr. Cranston is uttering the words of someone else. Someone else? Yes, a, a will stronger than his own dominates him, dictates his every word and action. You mean a form of hypnosis? Have you ever heard of telepathic hypnosis? Why, of course. A book has been published on the subject just recently. In fact, I have a copy in my office. I feel only an authority on that subject can help Mr. Cranston. We must send for the author of that book. But, Miss Lane, the theories of hypnosis described in this particular book have not been endorsed by the medical profession. It makes interesting Dr. reading. Dr. Anthony, but... we don't know what's wrong with Mr. Cranston. Perhaps I'm clutching at a straw, but his life is in danger. I insist that you call in that author. Very well. Nurse. Yes, Arthur? Go into my office. I'll phone this man to come here at once. Here, I'll write the name for you. Dr. Augusta Dharma. <laughs> Yes, nurse, what is it? Dr. Darman's here. Oh, thank heavens. Uh, how do you do, Dr. Darman? I'm Dr. Anthony. A pleasure. Uh, this is Miss Lane, a friend of the patient. I'm honored, Miss Lane. Oh, it's good of you to come, doctor. I hope you can help Mr. Cranston. I shall do everything in my power. I suppose you've come in contact with similar cases. Uh, frequently, Miss Lane. Is it possible, then, that Mr. Cranston's will is dominated by another? Quite possible. His very existence is in the hands of, uh, well, a uh, master mentality. Oh, doctor, please help him, please. Yes, uh, yes, of course, Miss Lane. I'll awaken the patient. No, doctor. I'll awaken him. Mr. Cranston. Yes? Open your eyes. Open. I. Why, Doctor, that's an amazing demonstration. Lamont. Lamont, this is Dr. Dharma. He's come to help you. Obey. Obey. Don't you understand? Why do you stare like that, Lamont? Dr. Anthony, Dr. Dharma, that's the same expression he had on his face just before he collapsed in the restaurant. He seems frightened. Dr. Dharma, do you... Miss Lane, Dr. Anthony, I think it best that you leave me alone with the patient. Of course, Doctor. It's a little cool in this room. Would you mind closing that window behind you? Uh, the window? Window? Of course, I, I... I'll take care of it. Now, if you please. Certainly, Doctor. We'll leave at once. Come, Miss Lane. Dr. Dharma, I place my last hope in you. Uh, Mr. Cranston will be well taken care of. Thank you, Doctor. Well, Cranston, we meet again, eh? We meet again. Oh, yes, of course. Your vocal cords. I'd quite forgotten. You can think clearly enough, but can't express yourself. Well, I shall lessen the pressure a bit for the moment so that you and I can have a little tete-a-tete, -tete, eh? <laughs> you may talk, Cranston. You may talk. You murderer. You fiend. <laughs> Rather a spectacular beginning for a tete-a-tete. -tete. There may be a spectacular end to it, too, Dr. Dahmer. There's a limit to your control. The facts dispute you, Mr. Cranston. You are helpless. You can speak no louder or no longer than I choose to permit. You've grown rich by murder and fraud. But in some way, I'm going to put an end to you. Come now, Cranston. Your slight respite is over. I returned you to the condition that baffles science and destroys you. My will is your will. My orders, your command. Obey. Obey. My will. Your will. Obey. Obey. Precisely. Now, Cranston, I leave you to your doom. You shall be dead by morning. <clears throat> Before our second act begins, let me ask you a question. Have you ever talked to an older person who said, 
Well, of course, things are a lot easier for you people now than they were in my day. I guess you can't blame older folks for being just a bit envious, for we have so many new improved products which make present-day living easier. The list is practically endless. Just for example, take blue coal. Now, thousands of you homeowners will agree with me that blue coal has certainly simplified living. Its use has brought home heating comfort that wouldn't have been thought possible a generation or so ago. For blue coal burns so much better, requires so little furnace attention, and it gives you safer, more dependable heating service and satisfaction. You see, blue coal is a guaranteed product of the Glen Alden Coal Company, the nation's largest hard coal producers. All their superior resources, equipment, and care in mining and preparation combine to make blue coal the finest hard coal money can buy. That's why it will pay you to make your next fuel order a supply of blue coal. See what a tremendous difference it makes compared to ordinary anthracite. Then you'll join the thousands of regular blue coal users who say there's no substitute for blue coal for perfect heat with less furnace attention. Call your dealer tomorrow. His name is listed in the where to buy it section of your classified telephone directory under the words blue coal. Cranston, any better, Dr. Anthony? Sorry, Miss Lane. No improvement. Oh, this is terrible. It's horrible. Even Dr. Dahmer couldn't help. No, he said the patient refused to cooperate. Under the circumstances, help was impossible. I'm afraid Mr. Cranston lacked faith in Dr. Dahmer. If there was some way I could... Dr. Anthony, you have a copy of Dr. Dahmer's book. Yes. That might do it. If we show Mr. Cranston the book, he might realize how important Dr. Dahmer is. Well, we can try it. Uh, nurse. Yes, Arthur. Go across to my office. You'll find Dr. Dahmer's book on my desk. Bring it here, please. Yes, Arthur. Dr. Anthony, the phone line is on. Oh, thank you. I'll answer it. Hello? Yes, sir. Wants to speak to Mr. Cranston. Well, that's impossible. You... Well, I see. All right, have him come up. I'll talk to him. What is it, Doctor? The driver of the car that killed the girl goes on trial tomorrow. His lawyer's downstairs in the reception room. He thinks Mr. Cranston can save the boy. Well, perhaps the plight of the boy might stimulate Mr. Cranston's interest. Why, yes, there is that possibility. Here's the book, Doctor. Let me have it. Yes, Miss Lane. Look, Lamont. This is Dr. Dahmer's book. You see his name on the cover. He's a tremendously important man, Lamont. You must let him help you. Miss Lane, I believe we've stuck something. He's thumbing through the pages. I think we've aroused his interest. Oh, well, that's the lawyer. You must put him off, Doctor. Yes, nurse, tell the gentleman we can't see him just yet. Uh, yes, Doctor. Look, Doctor. He's actually reading the book. This is the first break in the case. Oh, I hope so. Uh, Dr. Anthony. Yes, nurse, what is it? All that lawyer wants is for Mr. Cranston to establish how far the automobile was from the girl when she stepped off the curb. He brought this enlarged photograph of the scene of the accident in the hope that Mr. Cranston could mark the spot on the picture. Well, I'm afraid that... Doctor, have... Doctor, look. <laughs> Mr. Cranston's reaching out for the photograph. I believe... Do you think he recognized it? Apparently. Him? Apparently. Nurse, let me have that photo. Yes, Miss Lane. Here, Lamont. Show us where the automobile was when the girl stepped off the curb. Uh, why, he's drawing his finger over the picture. No, no, Lamont, not there. The place where the car uh, was. Now, oh, he's indicating a spot on the sidewalk. You see, it's useless. His brain isn't functioning. Uh, why, look, look, Miss Lane, he's, he's pointing from Dharma's name on the book cover to the spot on the photograph. Doctor, Doctor, I see it now. What? He's placing Dharma at the scene of the accident. Oh, Doctor, don't you understand? Lamont has met that man before. That's why he was so agitated when Dahmer came in here. Why, I believe you're right, Miss Lane. That's why he keeps repeating the words, We will meet again. Do you think Dahmer might be the influence that dominates Mr. Cranston? I don't know, Doctor. Uh, Look, Miss Lane. He's pointing to a passage in Dahmer's book now. What is it, Lamont? Uh, Read the passage, Miss Lane. Should the controlling mind lose poise for even an instant... In that moment, the spell is broken, and the will of the subject released. If the controlling mind loses poise... Window. Window. Window? Window. Oh, he's trying to tell something by association of ideas. What significance can the window have? I've got it, Doctor. What? Do you remember when you asked Dahmer to close that window? He lost his poise. He never went near it. He didn't dare look out of this 26th floor window. Of course. I thought his conduct strange at the time. Dahmer is a victim of a phobia. 
the fear of high places. That is what Mr. Cranston is trying to bring up. We shall meet again. Doctor, we've got to get Dharma back up here. We've got to make him lose his self-control if only for an instant. It's the only way to break Dharma's influence. But will he come? He's washed his hands of the case. I think I know a way to get him here. Get the chairs out there on the terrace, nurse. Yes, sir. Dr. Anthony, I think we'd better move Mr. Cranston's bed a little closer to the edge. Yes, hurry, Miss Lane. Dharma's already on his way out. Where do you want this chair, Miss Lane? Right over there, close to the parapet. How did you manage to get Dharma to come up here? Well, I simply phoned and told him Mr. Cranston was getting well. He nearly dropped the phone. He was so nervous. Oh, uh, uh, that must be Dharma. Yes. Uh, now, look, I'll, I'll go through the next room and leave you and Mr. Cranston alone with him. Yes. Nurse, you show Dr. Dharma in, and you can go. Thank you, Doctor. Good luck, Miss Lane. I certainly hope this goes Oh, I out. hope so, Doctor. Hurry, hurry. Good luck. Lamont, watch him. Watch Dharma every second. This is our only chance to beat him. Uh, oh, Dr. Dharma, I'm glad to see you. How do you do? I, too, am glad... Isn't this rather unwise, having having Mr. Cranston out here? It's it's quite windy at this house. Mr. Cranston requested it. Requested it? Mr. Cranston did. Yes, won't you sit down, Doctor? Uh, here's a chair, right over here. Yes, I... Well, pardon me, Miss Lynn, but, but I'm pressed for time. I must examine Mr. Cranston alone, do you mind? Not at all, Doctor. I'll lead... Oh, oh. Hey, Miss Lane, look out. Oh, I tripped. How awkward. You nearly fell over the edge. Oh, did I frighten you, Doctor? Oh, come away from oh, there. I'm sorry. I'll leave you now with your patient. Uh, yes, I... Miss Lane, look! Mr. Cranston's gone. <laughs> what was that? Should the controlling mind lose poise for even an instant? <laughs> Thanks for the tip, Doctor. Miss Lane's fake stumbled at the trick. You lost poise. Who are you? Your liberated subject, Lamont Cranston. I can't see you. Right, right, Doctor. Nobody ever sees the shadow. The shadow? You? Yes, Doctor. I've heard of you. The invisible. But this can't be. You accomplish this through hypnotism. Correct, Doctor. We're masters of the same art. We apply it quite differently. You have hypnotized me. All my life I've looked forward to an encounter with a shadow... I felt it would be the ultimate test of my hypnotic powers. Well, here we are, Doctor. Quite so. And you shall see who is master. What do you mean? I lost control over your will. But only for the moment. You're a fool if you think you can best me. I have just to touch you, and you will again be helpless. If you can touch me. You have made one mistake, a fatal one. Mistake? Your selection of an arena was thoughtless. This terrace is small. You'll have to pass me to get away. I warn you, Dama. This may mean your doom. I know where you are now. There. I'll... Oh! <laughs> You've lost the first move. You can't touch me, Dama. It's useless to try. Your wisest course is to surrender and settle with the law. Never. Ha! Ah. You moved that chair. You're in the corner near the wicker fence. Now we'll see if well, you doctor. can uh, get back from the edge. Ah! Lamont, Lamont, are you all right? Yes, Margot. I heard a scream. It was Dharma. Lost his balance. Oh. Fell 26 stories. Oh, Lamont. Well, thank God you're safe. Oh, it was so ghastly, you lying there, aware of everything, not able to express your thoughts. You expressed them very well for me, Margot. If it were not for you... This would be my hour of doom instead of Dharma's. He had an amazing mind, Margot. But like so many brilliant minds, it was bent in the wrong direction. Men like Dharma would be a boon to mankind if they used their talents constructively. We'll introduce our special guest in just a moment. But first, let's hear from Blue Coal's heating expert, John Barclay. Thank you, Ken Roberts, and uh, good afternoon, friends. Many homeowners are under the impression that all they need do to put coal on the furnace fire is throw on a few shovels full. 
I can assure you that that's neither the most practical nor the most economical way to get satisfactory heating results. First, the grate should be shaken gently until you see the first red glow in the ash pit. Be sure not to shake red hot or unburned coal through into the ash pit. For then you'll simply be wasting coal. Next, pull a mound of live coals to the front of the firebox, just inside the fire door, with a shovel or a hole. Now you have a fire bed sloping down toward the back of the furnace. Put fresh coal into the hollow formed by this slope, being sure to leave a few burning coals near the door. These live coals will act as a pilot light, which will burn off the gases which rise from the fresh coal contact with the burning coal. Try this method of putting coal on the fire and see if it doesn't give you far more satisfactory heating results. And remember, if at any time you have difficulty with your heating plant, get in touch with your nearest blue coal dealer. He'll gladly send a John Barclay serviceman to show you how to fix up the trouble. John Barclay service is absolutely free. So call your blue coal dealer. I thank you. And now I have the privilege of presenting Dr. Lorne W. Barclay, National Director of Camping Activities of the National Council of the Boy Scouts of America. By the way, you're not related to John Barclay, our heating expert by any chance, are you? Not that I know of, but I've heard his heating advice on this program and found it very useful. Good. Dr. Barclay, the producers of Blue Coal have asked me to congratulate your great organization, the Boy Scouts of America, on the 29th anniversary of its founding. Through the years, the Boy Scouts have made many important contributions to the finest American ideals. And for that, we salute you. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. And may I say that we are grateful to the sponsors of the Shadow Program. They, too, are making a valuable contribution to Americans, young and old, by showing them that crime in any form does not pay. We appreciate having had you with us this afternoon, Dr. Barclay, and we sincerely hope you will visit us again. Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The Shadow Magazine is now on sale at your local newsstand. Same time, same station, Blue Coal, America's finest anthracite, will again present another thrilling adventure of the shadow. Be sure to listen, and be sure to burn Blue Coal, the solid fuel for solid comfort. <laughs> 